Good morning. My name is Glenn Diger, and I'm really happy to be speaking uh, with you this morning through this uh, uh, electronic medium. Let me introduce myself. I'm currently the president of the International Water Association. I'm also a senior vice president and chief technology officer for CH2M Hill, an international project delivery firm with a large water practice. I am a registered professional engineer and have been a water uh, practitioner for my entire 35-year career, which has been with CHM Hill. And also in mid-career, I had the opportunity to serve as professor and chair of environmental systems engineering at Clemson University in the US. I'm also a member of the US National Academy of Engineering. Pleased to speak with you today about the need for a new urban water management paradigm. A focus on urban water because we have become an urban planet with, as you know, the majority of human, the human population already living in cities, towns, and villages. Moreover, urbanization will increase in the future as essentially every one of the roughly three billion additional citizens of planet Earth that would be added to our population between now and the middle of the century will live in urban areas. Why do we need a new paradigm? There are several reasons for this, but let me frame it hopefully in a, in a simple fashion. Going back into history, today we use an approach to urban water management that has not fundamentally changed for millennia. We identify pristine water supplies that are located remote from urban areas, transport this collected water to the urban area where it is treated and distributed. When people, commercial establishments, and industry use it, quite frankly use it only once, we collect the used water, treat it, sometimes, quite frankly, a lot of times it's not treated, but at most to a modest quality to minimize pollution and then return it to the environment. So it's a system of one use, it's supply oriented, and assuming, quite frankly, a significant assimilative capacity of the environment because the return water is of poor quality than we, what we take out of it. Although some look at this as an invention of the second half of the 19th and the first half of the 20th century, indeed it really is the same system that urban areas have been using for millennia. Just think of the systems of ancient Rome. So what has, so what has changed? Why can't we continue to do this? The biggest driver is population growth from less than a billion historically to one to two billion in the latter uh, half of the 19th and the first half of the 20th century to nine to ten billion that we'll have on planet Earth in the middle of this century. Along with that we have the associated consumption of resources driven by both population growth and in increasing uh, aff affluence. Uh, this nearly tenfold increase in population needs more water for people, but also more water for industry, agriculture, and energy production, leading to widespread water scarcity. And many of the water supplies that do exist are no longer pristine because of the return of poor quality water from previous uses. So we have increased uh, population, increased use of resources leading to also to resource scarcity. We see this most visibly in the energy area, but other resources such as phosphorus are becoming scarce. So we have some issues in front of us. The good news though is that new technologies and approaches are available to allow us to manage water and the resources in it in a much more efficient fashion. Now let me take and restate this in a manner that might be helpful by just asking you a question. Why would we expect a system that evolved over millennia when the global population was less than a billion living in mostly rural areas and lacking modern technology to be the solution with 10 billion people living mostly in urban areas on a water short and resource constrained planet, but with modern technology. Let me also ask that in what other area of 
human life, do we do things essentially as we did them a century or even a millennia ago? We just don't do that anymore, right? Of course we have to change to these changing realities. So we could look at this as a problem and hope I've convinced you that if we continue to do things the way we, we do uh, today, that we will have a problem. The question then is, do we have a solution? The overwhelming answer to this is, yes, we do have a solution. That's the good news. The bad news is that we must change. Uh, and in this sector, we have a hard time changing. So let's look first at what we need to change to. The keys are to tap into new water supplies and to use water more efficiently and in nearly closed loop systems in a manner which consumes less resources and indeed extracts resources such as energy and nutrients from the used water stream. Sound like a pipe dream? It isn't. Local water supplies such as harvested rainwater and especially reclaimed used water will replace these remote uh, water supplies. And I can tell you that if we use water properly, these water supplies will be sufficient. We use water in uh, integrated multiple use systems that are distributed throughout the urban area. One change, of course, is that we'll be building our water supply and used water systems in an integrated distributed manner not in the sequential uh, fashion in which infrastructure has been constructed in the past. Out of these systems, we'll also extract energy and nutrients from the used water stream. And when we return water to the environment after multiple uses, it will be of a quality which restores and enhances the environment, therefore protecting and preserving our precious water supplies. All of these things are possible. In fact, they're being done today, just not widely and consistently enough. So we have solutions to build on, and we will continue to improve on them, especially as we use them much more broadly. That's the good news, the solution. But we are a conservative sector that tends to change very slowly. So what do we need to do to accelerate change in the sector? We have programs, fortunately, like this IWA Cities of the Future that are focused directly on changing the behavior of the sector and the profession to accomplish this. And again, I want to emphasize that, quite frankly, we have the technology and associated know-how to, to, to begin to and to continue to implement these newer, higher performing systems. What we need to do, first of all, is to change our default value from the old to the new. This requires changing uh, the way we do a number of things. First of all, in how we develop our institutions, how we think about paying for the necessary infrastructure, and operating and re renewing these systems. Quite frankly, from my perspective, it's a great time in terms of reinvention and innovation. It's a great time to be a, a practitioner. We can do what we need to do because we know what to do, and we just need to get on with it. Now let me offer a little bit of advice to the bank in terms of how you can accelerate the implementation of this new paradigm. There are several things that I'd like to suggest, and let me do that in just the next uh, few minutes here. The first is for you to change your default assumptions concerning what is likely to be the best long-term solution for the communities that you work with. Assume that the conventional approach that I've, I've described is no longer the standard, but it is the exception. It may be used in some cases, but again, this will be the, the exception and not the rule. The new default should be these integrated, multi-use, largely distributed drinking and used water systems rather than the separate once through largely centralized systems that have been used in the past. Number two, support the champions, those individuals who are creating and implementing these models. 
both the organizations and especially the individuals within the organizations that you work with, and quite frankly, including within the bank itself. These champions will drive change. What we need to do is to give them a, lo a level playing field in the intellectual debate and in the competition for funds. And most importantly, when they are successful, make sure and share their successes. These things are happening. We need to, to spread the good word, get the word out, and legitimize this new paradigm. Third, let's create some incentives for the implementation of these new, more efficient systems. Reward increased water use efficiency, resource use efficiency, and the extraction of resources, energy, and nutrients from the, uh, the uh, used water stream by giving preference to utilities and to projects which achieve these results. This is actually not as hard as it sounds. For example, we could set standards for net per capita water use along with the associated level of service and use this as the principal criteria for making uh, awards uh, by the bank. Similar criteria can be established for resource use and resource extraction. Use these as the principal metrics for, de for determining where you spend your money and use this to drive behavior. Fourth, embed these concepts of this new paradigm into the institutional strengthening efforts that you support. Educate and tra train utilities and ser service providers in the new paradigm and then reward them when they adopt it, per the comments above. Let me stop here. You can see that we have a lot of work to do together, but the direction forward is very, very clear. Thank you for the time and attention you've afforded me. Congratulations on a successful meeting. and I urge you to, to thoughtfully consider the ideas that I've offered to you today. Thanks very much.